Welcome to the Good News Only Radio Show. My name is Tanya McIntyre. And as you may have guessed from the name of the show, yes, I am indeed passionate about positive media. I founded the Good News Only in 2010. I wanted there to be a resource where people could watch, read, and hear all the good things about all the good people in the world because I know for a fact there are far more good things going on in the world than bad and far more good people in the world than bad. And as always, I have one of those good people with us for this episode of the Good News Only radio show. Mark Auger is the founder of InspiringConsciousBeginnings.ca. Definitely a website you want to bookmark on your search engine. That's InspiringConsciousBeginnings.ca. It's all about creating positive change. And Mark has an extraordinary story that he's going to share with us. Mark, welcome to the Good News Only. It's so great to have you here. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much for having me on today, Tanya. I really appreciate it. Well, Mark, we first met in October of 2015 when you were doing your annual wellness show in Guelph, and I was thrilled to be part of that experience, and you do these every year because you have quite a story to tell the world. In fact, it's going to be in a documentary that we can all share very soon. But first, I want to introduce the audience to you and hear a little bit about your remarkable story, Mark, because you recovered from what was considered to be incurable cancer. And once we hear that word cancer, we all kind of freeze in fear. I know it's a lot to ask for you to give us any kind of a condensed version of what that experience must have been like for you, but our show is only 30 minutes, so I want you to share with us kind of the, the condensed version, if there can be such a thing when you hear you have incurable cancer. Absolutely. So I was diagnosed with stage 4 inoperable cancer in March 2011, and the cancer was located at my gastric esophageal junction and had metastasized to my peritoneal cavity in my lid system. In really the terms of conventional medicine, my cancer was incurable and it was terminal. I went home basically devastated with that type of news. I, I really didn't know how to react. I was in a very, very low period in my life. Um, Basically, I just started searching, and I started to look inward for answers, and I really just set an intention to heal, and I started to take action and move forward with that. I had very strong family support, and I decided just to go for it, and I was all in for whatever I needed to do to heal. So I went back to Princess Margaret, which was the hospital where I would be receiving treatment, and I agreed to do the treatment plan that they were offering me, and basically it was an 18-week chemotherapy treatment plan, and uh, that was just to prolong my life at best, and it only had about a 40% chance of having any effect at all, and I was given a 0% chance of ever being cancer-free. So that's pretty much where I started from uh, from the conventional side of things. Wow, that's quite a prognosis. I'm curious to know how it started for you. Were you in pain? You went to the doctor. What did you have? Like, where did the tests come from? Well, basically... Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, a bleeding ulcer, and um, they performed a scope, the doctor at the hospital, and he said I was far too young to have anything else going on, and he didn't bother to do a biopsy, so I just went on with life thinking that I had an ulcer, and I just started to not feel very well at all. I started to get more sick, and I was vomiting up blood, and I had to go back up to the hospital a few months later, and I almost needed a blood transfusion, and they decided to do... uh, a biopsy at that time, and I was diagnosed with cancer in my... St- I had a uh, cancerous uh, tumor in my stomach area at that time. So that's where that started from. And uh, so I didn't find out it was terminal till later on because I was basically going to have uh, surger- surgery and radiation and chemotherapy to remove the cancer in my stomach area. And I went for a final uh, PET scan at Princess Margaret, and I guess it just lit up, and it showed that it had metastasized to uh, different areas, and that made it incurable and terminal, and surgery and radiation was off the table at that point, and I really could just do a type of palliative uh, chemotherapy treatment. Wow. 
How does a doctor deliver that kind of information? Were you s sitting across the desk? Like, did he say, okay, so Mark, you better get your affairs in order because uh, there's no turning back from this one. Like, how, how do you deliver that news as a that's doctor? That's exactly it. That's, that's, that's how they deliver it. Holy. I think that they're trained, really, that you can't really get too emotionally attached, attached to patients because they have to deliver this type of news a lot. So I was waiting in the oncology waiting room for... Basically, I had a team of doctors, and I didn't think anything had happened, and I was just waiting to start chemotherapy because I thought I was having surgery, and uh, I was waiting for my uh, my normal oncologist to come in, and someone came in who I'd never seen before, and he just sat down, and he said, Mark, we've got some really bad news for you. Your cancer has metastasized and now is terminal, and um, there's no surgery or radiation that we can offer for you. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Wow. Like, no, no, I have like a team of doctors and we have a treatment plan and everything. I'm supposed to be starting everything Monday. And he's like, your team of doctors are gone and uh, that treatment plan's off the table now. Things have, have changed and this is what we can offer you. And then they get into a bit of a, a spiel about what they can do or can't do. And, um, and then, then you start to hear numbers about how long you might live and stuff like that. But Jeez. to be honest with you, I think I was in shock, and I really didn't hear a whole lot of anything at that appointment. My dad and my sister were with me, and they were the ones who really told me most of the information when I got home, um, and we had a conversation about it. Like, my dad was really quiet, and my sister was crying. It was really just a, it was a pretty terrible experience, the whole thing, to be honest. Shocking. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. I can't imagine having that kind of news delivered to me, especially when you thought that you were on a treat, you know, you were ready to start another treatment plan for something that you thought was. Just yeah, yeah. And it, it, like everyone was shocked. I was shocked. My family was shocked. The doctor who originally diagnosed me in Guelph was shocked. I think, I, I honestly think that my doctors at Princess Margaret were shocked too because they didn't expect that to happen. With the, but the PET scan is, is the scan that I guess that can test close to the, the most cells and, uh, it's probably the best scan that you can do. And uh, that was the final one I did, and then I guess it just lit up. So Amazing. And when did you set that intention to heal yourself? I mean, you, you had to recover from the shock. So what was that like? You know, you're driving home, you're thinking, wow, I've just been told I'm going to die. Well, like, that's a great question. And really it's a bit of a process because you go home and you've been told you're going to die. And then <laughs> you... you you have to pick yourself up from that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's incredibly difficult to do that because we really hold doctors on a pedestal, and once they're telling you that they don't have any confidence at all and that you're probably going to pass away quite quickly, um, it, it, it takes a bit of time. So really, I think it was about a week after I found out that my condition was terminal, and, um, you know, I had a conversation with my brother about some stuff, and uh, we really just... You know, we talk things out as a family, and I just said, you know what, I've got nothing to lose and everything to gain, and I'm going to set an intention here to heal. And there's really two parts to intention. I think in setting an intention is one part of it, and taking action is the other part of it. So I made a decision to set an intention to heal, but I also made a decision that I was going to work incredibly hard to achieve that goal. Mm hmm Up until that point, Mark, had you, were you kind of, you know, that glass half full kind of guy with a positive attitude that, you know, I can work with the, the laws of the universe and get positive energy working for me? Or did this kind of all come flooding into you Every, after? Everything the, came flooding into me all at once. And before everything happened, like I would say I was a positive guy, but I really wasn't awake in my life really too much at all like I was just really going through life and just living a regular life and getting diagnosed with terminal cancer really like it forced me what but it was a choice I made to really do what I needed to do and like understand what I needed to do and really go through that spiritual awakening and like connecting to a higher power and using surrender and prayer and it's just it was just stuff I that I knew that I needed to to do to move forward. Mm -hmm. Did you have any kind of religious background at that point? To that point, like, like I grew up like Protestant, so I was really familiar with the, the Jesus Christ story. And, um, you know, there's just, as I got older, I was like, there's a lot of holes in, in religion. And like, I have a lot of reverence for many religions, but to that point, I just, it made me kind of step away from it. And um, when I got sick, I just, 
I knew that I needed to have that connected that connection to a higher power. And I'm not religious. I'm not religious today, but I really feel I have a strong connection to that divine energy. And um, so to answer your question, uh, at the time I wasn't really, really religious, and I'm not really religious now, but I don't feel that you have to be religious to really have a connection to the divine energy. Divine energy. I have conversations with people all the time who talk about this energy of the universe, that sure. it, it's a collective energy and a lot of people do define it as God or a higher power. A lot of atheists even can uh, relate to being connected to something well, bigger than themselves. Absolutely. And it's, and it's whatever, like I always tell people, it's whatever that means to you. It could be God, love, source, the universe, divine energy. Whatever feels right for you and your soul is what it means. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you made some instant lifestyle changes, you said. Like, what was your lifestyle like before the diagnosis compared to the changes you made? My lifestyle was very, very different. I used to really enjoy drinking alcohol, <laughs> and I'd have the odd cigarette. So I was, I was very much in the social lifestyle. I, I would say that I ate pretty well. Um, you know, I never really thought too much about it. So when I found, found out that my condition was terminal in uh, medical terms and that they were offering me just uh, chemotherapy that may just prolong my life at best, I knew I needed to make up some ground. So mm-hmm. I decided right off the get-go to take myself off refined sugars because sugar feeds cancer, remove any GMO foods from my diet. Um, all my food intake was plant-based and organic. I began juicing vegetables, making up to six juices a day. I learned the importance of having a neutral pH and pH means power of hydrogen, and that really measures the alkalinity in your body. So cancer can't live in an alkaline environment. So if you want to measure your uh, pH level, let's say 1 is the most acidic and 14 being the most alkaline, I try to achieve a neutral pH every day, and that would be about a 7 to 7.3. And to achieve a neutral pH, you would do a lot of juicing, and drink a lot of alkaline water and eat a lot of green vegetables. So that's something that I would do to make my body alkaline. I also changed like my home products such as soaps and deodorants, toothpaste to organic. And the idea was really just the less chemicals, the better. Mm -hmm. Um, I began to use castor oil every day. And castor oil is oil that that has been obtained from castor beans. And basically it can act as an antiviral, an antibacterial, and an antifungal. And it also is known to shrink tumors. So this was like a no-brainer for me. It was something I could do. So to apply it, I would uh, place the castor oil on the tumor area, which was my stomach, and then I'd place saran wrap over the oil. I'd lie down on my yoga mat, and I'd have a heating pad already heated up, and I'd place that heating pad over the saran wrap. And I started doing that about 15 minutes a day, and that would gradually move to 20 minutes, half an hour. And I built it up to about an hour, and I'd do that for about an hour each day. And I also worked with a great nutritionist and naturopath doctor, and they really helped uh, guide me with what uh, supplements and vitamins and herbs to take because it was really important to keep my immune system strong and body functioning functioning as optimally as it could. Mm. You mentioned that you had a conversation with your brother. You're you're pretty close to your family, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you, you mentioned on your website that uh, in this conversation with your brother, he said, you have one of two choices. Yeah, yeah. So after, so it was right around the week when everything had happened, and uh, I was really doing some soul searching. And I would say this is probably before I set the intention to heal. Um, I was really at a crossroads in my life, and um, he basically told me that there were two roads I could take. I could start saying goodbye to everyone who I loved, or I could choose to move forward. And I remember him saying that, that he knew that I was going to have to go through a lot, but that he also knew that I could do it and that he believed in me and that our whole family believed in me. And after that conversation, I really, like, had a realization that everything I needed was within myself, and I just had to tap into that understanding. And all I needed to do was choose to believe in myself and move forward with that mindset. And that's what I decided to do. Do you think you would have reached that conclusion without the support of your family? Uh, To answer that question honestly, I don't think I would be here without the support of my family because they were the ones who really got me through it. They took me to every appointment. Um, It was just, they were just uh, so crucial to my recovery. They always 
they always reminded me that I was going to be okay and that all I had to keep doing was showing up every day. We never, ever had like a doomy, gloomy type conversation Mm -hmm. that something bad was going to happen. It was always just, you're going to be just fine. Just keep moving forward and doing what you're doing. You said you got this diagnosis in 2011. How old were you then? I was, I just turned 30 years old. Holy mackerel. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, um... It was devastating. Like I said, it was just out of nowhere. I had no idea that it was going to happen. <laughs> so you cha- instant lifestyle changes for you. Uh, neutral pH, very, very important. How do you measure your pH? Okay, so basically it's really easy. Um, if you go to a health food store, mm-hmm. they will sell strips, and they're called pH strips, and they're like this little like orange piece of paper on a roll. And you'd pull out a pH strip, and uh, I tested it with my saliva, so I lick my finger and then rub a bit, uh, a bit of my saliva on that uh, pH strip. And if it was leaning, like if the color was more yellowy orange, that would mean you were running more acidic. And if it was more greeny purple, that would mean that it, you were running more alkaline. So you, I always wanted to get to that greeny purple color each day. But it was like an everyday thing. For some reason, I would wake up and I would test my pH in the morning. And I, I think that probably a lot of us tend to run acidic. Well, I was just going to say, when you say acidic, I think of, like, lemon and vinegar. It's, Am I on the right track there, or is that nothing to do with to acidic? To me, it means, like, like, coffee and, like, white breads and, like, pastas. Oh, all the good things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, <laughs> and stuff like that. So that's, more, that's what I would think of more acidic. Did you actually cut out coffee? Yep. Oh, I don't know if I could. Well, that's, you know, you, but you have to seriously <laughs> ask yourself. If you're facing a life or death yeah. and it's pretty easy to cut out a lot of <laughs> No kidding. It's like, oh, I'm going to die. I don't know if I can give out, give out coffee. Yeah. You, and you know, that, and that's, some people say that, but like, <laughs> that was probably the easiest, out of everything I did, that was probably the easiest thing to do, was just give up anything that wasn't good for me, like alcohol or, or, or foods or, or whatever, it, it, coffee, it just... It was, it was a no-brainer. Amazing. So when you were seeking out your connection to a higher power, you wrote that the power of prayer was critical to your story. And you mentioned the word surrender. Yeah, absolutely. Many times. Explain what that means. Surrender to me really just means letting go and like getting out of your own way and allowing things to start happening for you. Um, it's really just connecting to your higher consciousness, your higher self, Tapping into that, and you could look at it as like your intuition. Intuition, I'm thinking, yeah, like we, we kind of grow up not trusting our intuition after a while because, well, I think it's it's pummeled out of us. We're discouraged from listening to that instinct. Totally. Mm-hmm. So, it's like the GPS of your soul, you know. Mm-hmm. Like my intuition, like when I was going through everything, was probably, if not my greatest asset because I really trusted how I felt about things. I didn't really have a lot of time, and like I had to make really big decisions so if something wasn't like sitting well like I just let it go and just moved on quickly to the next thing but if something felt really good I just went for it and that was like that intuition that gut feeling and it's it's one of the most important tools that we have and it's really crucial to use it absolutely I think we need to start trusting our instincts because like you said absolutely agree that voice knows what we need we just need to listen to it how did you seek out uh, healing people? How did you make those connections that were crucial to your recovery? Okay, so this is getting back to surrender, okay? So I feel that synchronicity is possible through surrender, and when I say synchronicity, I really mean like people or circumstances or opportunities come into your life at the perfect time and assist you on your journey. So basically through, I look at everything as kind of working in tandem together, like intention and surrender and the power of prayer. So I was amplifying like that intention out into the universe like let's say I had a vision that I would like to work with a healer or something like that and I would put that out in my intention so healers come into my life at the perfect time like to assist me on my journey I never really like went somewhere to find a healer the only thing I really did to do that was uh, my parents went to um, or my mother and sister went to Adam the dream healer seminar to uh, receive some healing and set an intention, and I sent my photograph to John of God in Brazil to have a distant healing from him. But people and the healers I worked with really popped into my life really at the perfect time, kind of unexpectedly, to uh, assist me. And was that something that you had set out to attract in your life? Yeah. Ab- well, yeah, absolutely. Like through through intention and through the surrender, it was through, through that that I was vibrating out. Mm. 
You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a certified uh, facilitator in law of attraction through Michael Lozier. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of Michael. Yes, I have. Yeah, Michael wrote a best-selling book called Law of Attraction. And it was, well, he had written it three years before Rhonda Byrne had come up with her uh, extremely commercially successful uh, book and movie called The Secret. So most people have heard of The Secret. Uh, oh, yeah, I've seen The Secret many times. But Michael Lozier had actually written a book about law of attraction, and it's a very um, detailed but very simple, factual book, step-by-step book about law of attraction, what it is exactly, and how you can make law of attraction work for you to attract more positive things. And he was very happy with uh, the success of The Secret, of course, because he had already written the book three years prior. So he literally rode on the coattails of Rhonda Byrne's really? success and skyrocketed to bestseller list. That's awesome. It was awesome. So he's one of my favorite Law of Attraction experts. In fact, I did a a series with him on Law of Attraction to teach people about this powerful law of the universe. This is not just a philosophy. We are vibrating beings living in a vibrating universe. We operate on a frequency. Absolutely. And, you know, I wish I could put law of attraction in a Petri dish or under a microscopic slide to pass it around a room and say, look, there is law of attraction. But it's, you know, you can't. It's, but it's science. It's like law of gravity. It's as real as a law of the universe as it can be. So did you think about law of attraction when you were? I did, actually. Mm-hmm. And I think it was probably in the month of May, my sister brought me the DVD The Secret. Uh, she said, you got to watch this. Uh, one of the doctors from my office gave this to me to give to you, and I watched it, and it made you know a, a lot of sense to me and began to use the law of attraction and just began to like visualize and welcome that into my life and trying to, cr- to create that through intention and like thinking positive and visualizing what I wanted to manifest. So absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. The reason I'm so passionate about positive media now, Mark, is because I spent so long in negative media, in mainstream media, those messages that we keep getting inundated with day in and day out, they literally chipped away at my soul. I mean, you can't even check out your groceries without being, uh, you know, bombarded with these headlines saying, you know, you need to lose 10 pounds, get your bikini weight before the summer and all that crap. Or, you know, uh, for the new one now is we're never hairless enough. You know, you have to be uh, waxed or sugared or what all those things to remove hair. It's crazy. How did those messages affect you? What what kinds of strategies do you did you use going through what you were going through to uh, kind of block all that negativity? That's a great, a great question. Also, um, I I made a decision that I needed to remove any and all negativity from my life at that time. So I just made a decision that I was going to cut out any uh, media, like TV, uh, social media, anything negative that may weigh down what I was trying to do or may affect me negatively. So at that time, I never watched any news or or anything like that. Um, I do totally agree with you what you're saying about the... how it affects us because you were never pretty enough or handsome enough or slim enough or Mm -hmm. popular enough. And I think that there's just a lot of pressure on people today with the the media and the way they portray that. Um, I don't know, like, I have a pretty strong feeling about about mainstream media also. (laughs) Like, I just think it it tends to be a little bit too fear-based and... um, it seems like there's like a hidden agenda within mainstream media and it likes to manipulate the way people think to serve that agenda. And sometimes I think people can be quick to form an opinion um, on something that they've seen on mainstream media before they actually know the real facts about the story. And I don't really know if that's ever a good thing. Well, the big one now, uh, you know, I used to be a big fan of Chelsea Handler. She does a a Netflix special now. And, you know, she's she's a pretty raw comic. But, um, you know, I like her. She has a good head on her shoulders. But she had a guest on her show, um, and she was professed to be a journalist, and she had written something for Teen Vogue, and she was talking about journalism, and then she cited the Washington Post and the New York Times as reliable sources of information. I nearly fell off my chair. Yeah. So I went to the Internet just for fun. This was in December of 2016, and I just kind of put in the Washington Post to see what the headline was that day. Here's the headline that day. 
Fifteen years after 9-11, the jihadist threat looms larger than ever across the globe. Yeah, and that's just... That's totally untrue. That's, yeah. And, uh, there, there, are, are there are more people killed by firearms and drugs and alcohol-related uh, accidents than terrorism across the globe. And, oh, yeah. you know, the biggest threats to humanity are governments that are not being held accountable for things like balancing budgets and creating sustainable jobs and pr protecting our environment. And it seems like they try. There's two big media companies in the States that try, and they swing one and they swing one way right, and really they're about creating division within the collective so they can kind of hide all that stuff. Absolutely, yep. And, and I totally understand that. And for me personally, like, if I want to inform myself about a story or something, I usually will do a lot of research about it before I form an opinion. I'll go online or I'll look at, like, a news outlet like yourself, like a positive news outlet or a collective evolution, or I watch podcasts or something like that. Mm -hmm. I really feel like that... The media and the way we get our media is going to shift. I hope so. Oh, well, if there's going to be uh, like the the six o'clock news or the eight o'clock news, where you have to watch uh, commercials and stuff like that, it really seems like a lot of people are going to the internet and that are truth seekers and actually want the truth and the facts. Mm -hmm. so. Yep, I think there's a shift happening as well. Virtually everything we watch, read, and hear these days is literally controlled by just a few American conglomerates. And I don't think people fully appreciate that. So that's my mission in life, is to educate people on that kind of manipulation. And I know we're on the same page in that, uh, that I think mission. that's really important, because a lot of people just aren't aware of that, and they're just kind of floating and, and listening to what they're being fed on, on the mainstream media. Yep, just living on autopilot, not a good place to be. Be your own pilot, is what I say. For sure. <laughs> what are your wishes for the future? Mark, now that you have fully recovered from your incurable cancer. Well, it's, you know, honestly, each day is like a blessing, and I'm just completely grateful to be alive. Um, I'm really passionate about everything that I'm doing now in my life, and I just really think that I'm here to create as much positivity with my energy with the time that I have here, and uh, it's a pretty incredible feeling knowing that I'm in alignment with that now. Excellent. I'm looking forward to your documentary. Is it named yet? It is. So it's named Markedly, uh, A Healing Journey is a subtitle. Coming out like on April 29th, we'll be releasing it at our wellness show at the Guelph Delta and Conference uh, Center. So if anyone's interested in coming and seeing the film and checking out our wellness show, that'd be great. We'll have amazing guest speakers and incredible uh, holistic practitioners and exhibitors there. I'm also, I just started doing a mentoring sessions through my website. They're video mentoring sessions. And I really set this up for people who had been diagnosed with cancer and they're really in the beginning stage and they're looking for some help and guidance uh, that I could help steer them in the right direction. And we'd cover really four elements, uh, food intake and nutrition, uh, wellness, spiritual elements, and healing and energy healing. So that's something that uh, I've been working on and I've been able to help uh, a lot of people with it now. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we can access all of that and more resources on your website, inspiringconsciousbeginnings.ca, correct? Yeah, you can access all that information and uh, the mentoring sessions and information about our, our uh, wellness show, and there'll be information about the Markedly Healing Journey documentary coming up soon. Awesome. I'll look forward to that, Mark. And if you were to recommend a book on diet and nutrition, what would it be? That's a great question, and uh, I think since the theme today has been about healing cancer, I would like to recommend uh, Radical Remission, and it's from Dr. Kelly Turner, and it's a New York Times bestseller, and basically there's uh, stories in it just like mine of people who have overcome cancer against all odds, and they did a lot of similar things that I did, like uh, nutrition and uh, meditation and energy healing and just positivity and prayer. So that would be one for your listeners to check out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark Auger. You are an incredible person. I look forward to staying connected with you and watching all of your love and light being shone in the world. We so need it. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for everything that you're doing, too. Uh, it's really making a huge difference, and it's very inspiring to see. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks so much, Mark. 
And we'll look forward to your documentary. That's up for release April 29th, but you can stay connected to all, all that information and Mark on his website, inspiringconsciousbeginnings.ca. My name is Tanya McIntyre. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Good News Only. Remember to live well, laugh often, love always, and of course, stay positive. Stay positive.